Okay, well, th uh, is this Senator Jackson, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Stumberg, uh, thank you. And uh, if you want to uh, go right into it, we'll uh, take questions after. And, uh, Professor, this is uh, Representative Tree, and I have your PowerPoint, so just tip me off when you want me to move the slides. You're on the first one right now, competing proposals, you know, the main slide, the first one. <laughs> thank you, Sharon. I'll either refer to a page number or I'll actually say uh, next, okay. and that'll cue you to uh, hit the cursor and go to the next uh, the next level. So um, let's go to next page two. Um, as you can see, I'd like to briefly touch on five points, uh, and I mean brief. So let me race ahead and uh, talk about the first thing, which is to uh, very uh, succinctly describe how it is that the TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, might threaten tobacco measures. If you go to uh, slide three now, you'll see a chart um, that we discussed in June of 2012, the last time I was up there with you in person. So for those of you who are at that hearing, we discussed this chart at some length. The left-hand column uh, lists different clusters of tobacco control measures. These are these are requirements that countries must adopt uh, in order to comply with their treaty obligations under the first Global Health Treaty, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, so if you uh, look at this list of tobacco measures, um, I think the category dealing with services, advertising and distribution, uh, which is part of Article 13 down there, uh, that's a category where the state of Maine has actually adopted a law. Uh, for example, Maine in uh, Chapter 22 of the Maine Revised Statutes, prohibits sales of certain cigars that include flavoring. <clears throat> this is a parallel law to uh, to match the, the federal government's ban on flavored cigarettes. This one in Maine applies to flavored cigars. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm referring to specific tobacco control measures um, that would um, ban certain kinds of tobacco-related services. The column on the right shows you examples of different kinds of trade rules that are introduced uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement based on chapters that have either been leaked or chapters that uh, we assume will be replicated from existing U.S. free trade agreements into the TPPA. So again, let's just take one example without going through this whole chart. Um, one of those rules is a um, it's a so-called market access rule on circuses on on services, and to translate the legal jargon, that means that uh, countries may not adopt quantitative limits on services, and that prohibition has been interpreted at the World Trade Organization to mean that you could not adopt a quota of zero on a service. In other words, you cannot ban a service or even part of one. So when a government adopts a ban on a certain kinds of advertising or a ban on a certain kind of uh, retail or wholesale distribution service, uh, that's the kind of law that this trade rule prohibits. Is that making sense so far? Yeah. So if, if the trade rule prohibits the kind of law that Maine has already adopted, the only way to be consistent with the trade agreement is to fit into a series of fairly complicated exceptions that are designed to protect public health, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But that's that's an example of how a trade rule can be in conflict with laws that regulate tobacco distribution. <clears throat> Let's go to slide four now. Here's a different view. Um, the purpose of this slide is just to give you a sense of how trade agreements are designed so that certain chapters match up with certain types of, of national laws or state laws and regulations. And the the pattern there shows you <clears throat> which chapters of the TPPA might be in conflict with different types of tobacco control measures. <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell on this any longer because <clears throat> I'd like to jump right into describing to you on slide five the uh, <clears throat> proposal that the United States government introduced in the trade negotiations just two weeks ago. Excuse me just for a second. The uh, U.S. proposal has three parts. Part one would reduce tobacco tariffs to zero in all the participating countries. Um, 
This is really significant for Vietnam, which has tobacco tariffs in the range of about 100 percent right now. Um, that effectively uh, tamps down the introduction of imported tobacco products and the marketing to support them. Uh, Vietnam presently has a smoking rate of less than uh, 2 percent among women and girls. And for every other country that's opened up its market to foreign competition, um, there's been a, a fairly quick increase up to uh, 10 or 15 percent or more uh, in smoking by people who were not previously smoking before the tariffs were removed. The um, second and third elements of the U.S. proposal are inserts, like one-sentence inserts, into different chapters of the TPP. Uh, one is an insert into the health, ex the health exception, and another is an insert into the chapter on dispute settlement. So let me briefly explain both of these proposed inserts. Let's go to slide six. Based on public reporting, um, the U.S. proposal is uh, going to make an insert that says measures referred to in the health exception include measures necessary to prevent or reduce tobacco use or its harms. In my uh, conversations with various people inside and outside of government lead me to think that this is a fairly accurate quote of what the U.S. is, is proposing in the negotiations. And uh, if you'll click for the next level here. Uh, I think this is not legally significant for four reasons. So let me just tick off each of the four, and there's a separate uh, build on the slide, Sharon, for each yeah. of these four. So the first one is that health, rele health relevance is already self-evident. In other words, the health exception is indeed triggered by the type of measure, and it has to be a health measure. But no one disputes that tobacco control measures are health measures. In fact, the, the phrase that tobacco measures are self-evidently health measures is a quote from the WTO dispute panel that reviewed the um, U.S. ban on flavorings. The second point, if you go to the next click, is that health relevance does not establish necessity, which is the, um, the real test in the, in the health exception. The, the health exception incorporated into this trade agreement says that um, nothing in the agreement pre prevents the government from adopting measures that are necessary to protect human health. So the question is, well, what is a necessary measure? So there are three stages to, to establish whether a measure is necessary or not, and therefore whether the, it would be protected by this exception. The first stage is to determine the scope of health measures and this is the stage that the U.S. proposal directly relates to. It's the least onerous of the three stages. The second is a series of balancing factors that include whether the measure makes a contribution to its health objective, um, the importance of the values and interests at stake, which it may, see, it may seem obvious that protecting health is, in a, is a key societal interest, but what can be debated is the particular kind of measure and whether protecting health is its primary objective. In other words, you could argue that a licensing provision is not necessarily a health measure, that the interest it's protecting is government efficiency or collecting taxes or uh, you know, promoting transparency in terms of uh, collecting data for the census, things of that nature. Uh, and, and the final balancing factor is the degree of trade restrictiveness that's imposed by the measure. Uh, these are uh, factors that are weighed and balanced according to the WTO appellate body. Um, and then if on balance it's conclu uh, the conclusion is that a measure is necessary, that's called a prima facie case. And then it goes from there uh, to the third stage of analysis, which is whether there are less trade restrictive alternatives that are available. And then depending on the answer to that question, there's a conclusion as to whether you pass muster under the necessity test. So you can see it's a fairly complicated and highly subjective analytic process. And then if you go to the third stage, or the third point here, um, my argument is that necessity alone does not satisfy an exception. 
In other words, a measure can be found to be necessary, as was the case in the WTO dispute about U.S. Uh, limits on Internet gambling. Uh, but still, the panel could conclude that uh, you flunk these additional tests, one of which is that a measure must not be arbitrary, and that often has to do with whether or not there are other laws or regulations in place that seem to be pointing in the opposite direction. Uh, that was uh, uh, a serious problem for the United States government in the uh, Internet gambling case. <clears throat> and whether the, measure, whether the discrimination involved was justifiable or not, in other words, whether the dispute panel is convinced that um, there were no uh, protectionist sentiments behind um, any uh, discrimination. And that was the fatal flaw in the uh, case involving uh, the Indonesian challenge to the, uh, the U.S. ban on flavored cigarettes. In other words, they felt that the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the fact that the law allowed menthol cigarettes to remain in the market while closed cigarettes were excluded, that that was an inherently protectionist move on the part of Congress. So um, I say for last, the fourth reason that the U.S. proposal is not significant, um, the most important reason, which is that even if all these other elements of the general exception are satisfied, uh, the general exceptions do not cover investor rights. And it's Foreign investor rights that pose the greatest threat to tobacco control measures because um, private companies can bring these disputes at their own discretion. They do not have to go through governments. And so long as they have an argument to make, even if it's not strong on the merits, uh, these claims are being waged um, for strategic reasons. In other words, just to, to create the fiscal burden of defending a claim which can run into many millions of dollars over the course of several years. Let's move on to slide seven. Um, now that I've gone through the first part of the U.S. proposal, the, the second part of the proposal would insert a uh, sentence into the chapter on dispute settlement. And based on public reporting, we think it reads something like this. Before a party initiates a challenge through TPP dispute settlement to another party's tobacco regulatory measure, the health authorities or the concerned parties shall meet to discuss the measure. So it mandates consultation by health authorities. If you'll uh, click on to the next build, it's, um, uh, the point is that I think that this part of the U.S. proposal is likewise not legally significant um, for a couple of reasons. Let's go to the first one. The dispute chapter already includes several uh, consultation mandates. It already requires parties to consult on any matter, uh, whether it's a dispute settlement matter or any other matter that the countries don't agree on. It already requires parties to consult with each other when one country requests it. And it already requires parties to make experts or regulators available, including health regulators. So if you go to the next click, the U.S. insert is essentially redundant with all these elements that are already required for consultation by the TPP's dispute settlement chapter. Uh, the one piece that's not already covered is that it specifies that it's the health authorities that must consult with each other and they must discuss whether a measure is appropriate. So that might, and I say might have practical value. Um, but I don't think it's legally significant because when you think about how this all works, if you go to the final and third point, the U.S. proposed insert omits any element that might be legally significant. In other words, if the health authorities meet, there's no requirement that they report their conversation. Did they agree or did they not agree? So there's no transparency about this process, and no one would ever know whether they got together and simply went through a staged recitation of their positions or whether they actually had a meaningful conversation. And then even in the instance where they might actually agree on the appropriateness of a tobacco control measure, their agreement would have no bearing on the dispute. Uh, in other words, it would not result in greater deference to the law. There would be no presumption in favor of the law. And they would have no ability to block a dispute even if they agreed that the measure was appropriate. So let's go to slide eight and compare in summary now 
uh, how the U.S. inserts compare to Malaysia's carve-out. Um, point one is that the U.S. health insert relies on the health exception. And as I explained it to you, there are four stages of litigation you have to go through to use this exception, and they have six tests and balances. It's a very complicated litigation process, and it uh, costs many millions of dollars that countries have to bear uh, in litigation expenses. And 80% of the time, countries have to pay these expenses on their own, um, even when they are successful in getting a case dismissed. They are not able to shift these costs to the party bringing the case. If you go to the next point, um, as I explained before, the U.S. consultation insert on, uh, rather the U.S. insert on consultation is redundant. It does nothing to limit litigation. And by contrast, the purpose of a carve-out as proposed by Malaysia is to avoid litigation. A simple carve-out excludes a certain class of measures, so it leaves little to litigate. And even if there are some questions that have to be litigated, they're decided at the very beginning of a dispute. And to give you a sense of what a carve-out might look like, here's an example. The first phrase simply says, this agreement does not apply to something. That's the language of exclusion. And the final phrase says, it does not apply to measures as applied to tobacco. In other words, it's defining a scope of measures to carve out of the agreement by reference to what they regulate or what they relate to. There are a number of ways you could phrase this or fine-tune it depending on exactly what you want to carve out. So um, I guess I would summarize my point about the current U.S. proposal by saying that it's being offered as something that supposed, supposedly has value in protecting tobacco control measures, but it really adds nothing to the existing health exception, and it adds very little to the existing provisions on consultation. Um, the carve-out, on the other hand, uh, is a robust safeguard uh, that would go a long way toward avoiding litigation completely. And I guess I can pause there to see if there are any questions. Uh, any any questions? We're really buttoning up against time here, but any questions? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stumberg. That's very very informative. Appreciate it very much. Any, any Before I sign off, let me just say that um, in the handout you have, I have one additional page which uh, reminds you of what we discussed last summer in terms of the previous U.S. proposal. There is some confusion now with folks seeing the weakness of the current U.S. proposal, and they are remembering that the previous position of the United States uh, also purported to be a safe harbor for tobacco regulations. And so on that page, I list for you the five reasons why the previous proposal from the United States was a weak one. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I, we, I probably should have scheduled a little more time. Uh, but I, I really appreciate your time tonight.